Our, our discussion this evening is going to feature um, Rabbi David Ingram, who's seated here, uh, and uh, he is the founding rabbi of Kehillat Romamu uh, in the city. He uh, studied philosophy and psychology and religion at NYU and uh, was ordained uh, by Reb Zalman Shachter Shalami, who uh, was the uh, head of Renewal Judaism. Uh, the, I don't know if you call that a movement, but uh, okay, the Renewal Movement, um, in 2004. Yes. We have uh, to his left, uh, Rabba Sarah Hurwitz, who is the Dean of Yeshivat Maharat, which is a training institute for ordination for women who are Orthodox. Uh, she is um, uh, the, uh, the first uh, Maharat, the Mahiga Hilchati Bruchani Torani, but also earned at some point afterwards the title Rabba, which is um, the feminine form of the, uh, the Hebrew word Rav. And by the way, which uh, conservative rabbis in Israel who are female also earned that title Rabba. Just uh, um, worth uh, pointing that out as well. Uh, but uh, she is the not only the dean of Yeshivat Maharat, but also uh, part of the rabbinic staff. She serves in the role of uh, like what a rabbi would do at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale. Um, she uh, she graduated from Barnard and uh, was ordained by uh, Rabbi Avi Weiss, uh, who is also a rabbi at Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, and Rabbi Daniel Sperber in 2009. And to Rabbi Hurwitz's left is Rabbi Howard Stecker, who you all know and love. Um, graduated from Columbia in 1987. Thank you. And from the Jewish Theological Seminary in 1992. And has been in Great Neck since 2004 as the senior rabbi at Temple Israel here. And so we are we are privileged to have this uh, this uh, fine panel before us. Um, I'm going to begin by asking that I, and I'm Rabbi Allison, so I'm your MC this evening. So, um, please, uh, um, I, we're going to begin by actually giving each of the participants three minutes. Three minutes, Rabbi. Okay. Um, that is 180 seconds. Uh, in which you can the clock? <laughs> introduce yourselves and just give us a brief taste of uh, how you came to be where you are in your rabbit. Three minutes or less. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Rabbi Secker, thank you. Okay, I'm not going to take the full three minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll yield a few extra minutes to my colleagues. Um, by the way, we are all involved as the uh, fifth cohort of the Rabbinic Leadership Institute at the Hartman Institute in, uh, Initiative at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. And we actually had eight minutes to give our stories. And people who were sitting and looking on their iPhones to make sure that we didn't take more than eight minutes. So in typical rabbinic fashion, I've already taken half of my time to introduce my uh, little spiel. And I would say that um, for me, um, certainly childhood and adolescence had a very strong interest in Judaism. Um, from my congregation growing up, which was the Federal Jewish Center, um, it was strengthened at Camp Ramah certainly strengthened during my years of college. And at a certain point, I thought about a career in academia. I was thinking of a career either in biblical studies or maybe in English literature, some way of combining my interest in Judaism with my interest in literature. And then I realized that um, based on my work with children and also my work with adults, that for me an academic career would actually be um, too um, too theoretical, and that what I really wanted to do was to be able to combine my love for Judaism with my love of Jewish people. So the rabbinate seemed like a really fine way to be able to do that, to introduce and to help Jews to find their way vis-a-vis -vis Jewish tradition. So it's uh, been a very interesting ride. Um, I don't think when I started out serving as a pulpit rabbi that I imagined that I, would, that I would end up in a congregation such as Temple Israel. I think I might have imagined myself um, in, a, in a smaller congregation. And it's been really remarkably challenging and also very fulfilling for me to discover um, just the eclectic nature of working in a community such as this, working with preschoolers, working with seniors, um, high school students, helping people during difficult times, being with people during joyous times. And uh, I feel um, very much supported in my decision to be a rabbi who is involved both with Judaism and also with Jews. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, Rabbi Rose. 
First of all, it's so wonderful to be sitting next to my esteemed colleagues. So thank you so much for bringing us together. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with you, see some familiar faces. I've spent some uh, some time in, in, in Great Neck with, with friends, so it's so great to, to have you come here and be with me. Um, I, I never had that aha moment of wanting to be a rabbi because as a young Orthodox girl growing up in South Africa, it just simply wasn't an option. There was no model uh, for, for Orthodox women in clergy. And, um, but I loved shul. I loved shul and I loved being part of community. When I was in South Africa, I've, I've uh, won a religion. You know, everybody in South Africa is generally traditional. They go to Orthodox synagogues, but are not necessarily uh, religiously oriented. But my aunt was the one member of my family who uh, was was from was was uh, was traditional, and I just loved being around her Shabbat table, where she would gather people from the Selwyn Siegel, uh, people with Down syndromes, or she would gather uh, friends and family from, from far and near. And it was just a, a vibrant, uh, loving place and house. And uh, I, I just always knew that that's what I wanted for myself. And, and so when I immigrated and, and uh, grew up, went to high school in South, Af South Florida, um, I continued to gravitate towards an orthodox lifestyle and I just would do anything to get to shul. Uh, I don't know if you know the uh, South Florida uh, community so well, but there's a lot of canals and my family never lived right near the local orthodox synagogue. Um, so uh, at uh, an age where I was old enough to know better, I, I, I went swimming with an alligator one day to, to get to shul. Um, it, it had been raining and I had this uh, long, you know, two and a half mile walk and to cut it down just a little bit, I had to sort of go underneath a fence. And uh, although I'd just seen an alligator jump in the water before, I, I got to this fence that was, uh, had barbed wire in the top and and the water was above the gate, and, and it just didn't occur to me to go home. <laughs> um, and, so, uh, and so I think that, that uh, uh, I never allow barriers <laughs> to get in my way. Um, and I put one foot in front of the other, and uh, I just, my, my, my goal was, was always to be in shul, to, to be with community, to build community, and uh, I, I never imagined <laughs> That I would never imagine that I would be sitting as a rabbi in a in a Orthodox synagogue and now also the dean of of a school where we're training other women to be ordained and be uh, Orthodox rabbis in communities around America. What a great story! <laughs> I don't think I missed that story in, in the Hartman Fellowship. Um, it's really good to be sitting next to you, Sarah, and to next to Howard and uh, it's also really good to be back in Great Neck which is where I grew up. I grew up here in Great Neck on Hunter Myrtle Drive in Great Neck Estates. I uh, went to North Shore Hebrew Academy and my father was the president of the Great Neck Synagogue for years and um, if I think about the trajectory of my life from from Great Neck growing up as an Orthodox Jew in Great Neck, a modern Orthodox Jew going to Great Neck Synagogue and eventually going to Ramaz and having to schlep on the 652 train into New York City every single day from 6th grade through 12th grade. Um, my life essentially changed uh, when I was 18. I went to Israel for uh, a gap year between high school and college. And I like to say that when I tell my story that there are two great fears for Orthodox, modern Orthodox Jews, is that your kids go to Israel and they come back and then they marry somebody who isn't Jewish. Or the worst fear is your kids go to Israel for the year and they come back and they won't eat in your house because they're too from. <laughs> and the second one happened to my parents. I came back as an ultra-Orthodox Jew. Uh, age of, uh, I spent two years in Israel and at the age of 20 I came back with long pants and a black hat. And I wasn't going to go to college like my brother and my sisters. And uh, yeah, it was a, they almost sat shiva, exactly. And uh, about five or six years into an ultra-Orthodox experience where I was living in Chaim Berlin in Flatbush as an ultra-Orthodox yeshivish guy, I then left Judaism for 10 years uh, completely. And during that time I lived in New York City. Um, I wasn't involved in Jewish life at all. I wasn't involved in religion. Mostly I was into yoga. 
and into other more Eastern religious uh, spiritual paths. I was very into Buddhist uh, meditation and things like that. And I made a living as a waiter, which you can imagine growing up in Great Neck telling your friends that your son's a waiter. <laughs> I, I waited tables for a decade in New York City, and during that time I was also very involved in theater and acting and things like that. And um, at the end of that period of restaurants, I actually worked here in Great Neck at a couple of restaurants here in Great Neck. I might have waited on some of you, possibly. <laughs> and the annoying customers, I'll know why I'm about the end of the day of tonight's session, but um, I eventually, the end of that, I, I uh, it's a very complicated, I came back to to religious life through Chovavei Torah. I was two years in a non-Orthodox seminary, until I finally came out of the closet as a non-Orthodox person. I was never going to be Orthodox again, and it was at that moment in my life where I thought that I was completely done with religion, that I met Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalom, whom Seth alluded to, the founder of the movement called Renewal Judaism. And it's a long story about him, and I have about 30 seconds left. So he ordained me, and that's when I began uh, Roman Moon in 2006. And now we're eight years in, seven years full time, and we have almost 600 families and close to 1,000 members, individual members in New York City. And it, we, we seek to bring all the things that I kind of experienced into one place, a kind of the tum of a more orthodox experience with some of the yoga and, and Eastern things, meditation and things like that. And, and when I think about it, I, it kind of, I do think that from the beginning I knew that I was going to wind up doing this somehow and that uh, all of my detours were really destinations. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to point out that we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. So you might want, if you have questions, just uh, keep, a, keep a write them down or make a mental note. Um, uh, but what I'd like for us to do in the course of this discussion is actually, if, if you can talk with each other and respond to each other, that would be great to try to facilitate that. Our first, uh, the first thing we'd like to talk about is what do you see are the challenges facing the American Jewish community, and how are you each approaching those challenges in your way? And that's a broad question. It's, uh, <laughs> just to get the discussion started. Who would like to go? I'm not going first this time. <laughs> Choose someone who leaves with uh... All right, why did you go first since you were talking <laughs> So I think that there are a lot of challenges and opportunities that are facing the broader uh, North American Jewish communities at large. I think that, um, I mean to name many of, uh, a few of the, of the many challenges might be assimilation and uh, apathy, synagogue affiliation, affiliation in general, the disaffected Jews. I mean, you could go, the list is legion with things that are, that are affecting and problematic with the North American landscape. There are many wonderful things that are happening. The renaissance of, of the Jewish landscape in many different sectors is, is profound. I think that my particular niche is that I'm trying to, to work with a kind of post-traumatic God disorder. That I feel that there is, in a post-Holocaust world, and in, uh, in an American religious landscape where spirituality is either seen as something extremely new agey and marginal. One in three American Buddhists are Jewish. One in three American Buddhists are Jewish. All of the top tier of the American Buddhist scene, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Sylvia Borstein, all of these names that might not mean something to you, but for those who are involved in the spirituality of America, those are, are legendary names. Those are people like Ram Dass, the great Richard Alpert, who, was a, who kind of dropped acid with, with uh, Timothy Leary at Harvard in the 60s. These countercultural figures, there are thousands and thousands of Jews who are in ashrams and in monasteries and, and completely disconnected from the Jewish world. And not only that, many Jews who are looking for spirituality would sooner walk into a Chabad than they would into a synagogue because they want to be able to talk about God and not about Wissenschaft, which is the classic conservative model, but they want to talk about God and, uh, and they have an experience of the divine that they only get in their yoga studio. So my particular niche is trying to create a synagogue that is vibrantly Jewish, but also is transparently spiritual. And what that means, obviously, is a very, like, what do you mean, transparently spiritual? I can give very concrete examples of that. Uh, a little bit later maybe, but that's my particular niche. Like, how do we have the fervor of the neo or the Hasidic world with the liberal progressive egalitarianism and academic honesty of a conservative world, and how do you bring that together in one synagogue and attract people who would otherwise um, be looking for their ecstasy, you know, at a nightclub or in a yoga studio? And that's my particular, uh, my particular niche. 
I, I also think that people are, are looking for spirituality, are seeking meaning. And I also think people are looking to be relevant. I think, I think uh, Judaism needs to be relevant for people in order to become and be that, that, spiritual, uh, that spiritual experience for people. And, um, you know, I was thinking about a, uh, a Talmudic character that, that I came across when I was studying many years ago, and somebody who, who I felt when I, I met her in the Talmud was sort of like a, a long-lost friend of mine. And the, the story is, is about Yalta. She's about third, third century um, in the Amorite Amor, 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 Amor period. And uh, the story goes that she's in the baby drash and she's actually having a conversation with the rabbis. And um, that's unique for the Talmud, for women to be, uh, to be in dialogue. Um, and she's convincing a, a, a rabbi about her, her status, about whether she should go to the mikvah or not. And that rabbi says no. And so she goes to another rabbi and asks the same question. And you expect the, the story, the, the Gemara, to criticize Yalta for shopping around for Psak because you know, how can you go to one rabbi and then run across to another rabbi? Nobody's allowed to do that. Um, and then the story goes on to describe how actually Yalta wasn't shopping around for Psak, but she was entering into a conversation with the second rabbi and uh, explaining, to him, explaining to him why the answer that she knew was that she could go to the mikvah, why the answer should be so. And she managed to convince the rabbi to give her the right answer. And I remember thinking, learning about the story and thinking about what has become central to, to my Judaism and I think is, is impacting the, the, uh, the challenge that I see in, in the Orthodox community, which is that the, the, the boundaries of Orthodox communities are, are shrinking, are becoming, much, are becoming more and more limited. Um, and I really believe in a, a community, a Beit Midrash, so to speak, that can be expanded through dialogue with, between ra women and rabbis, between people and rabbis, um, between when, when uh, people are coming and, and uh, through their own knowledge, explaining, uh, explaining what their needs are and creating space for all kinds of, of, of Jews. Um, and I think that, that this kind of, of model of expanding the boundaries of the modern Orthodox community will help Jews who are feeling disaffected, students who can no longer remain in a community where they don't feel like they're participants, where they don't feel like they're active in their, in their community, will help Judaism feel relevant if they feel part of it. And so I think that, that is one of the, the challenges that I see uh, myself trying to, to affect of uh, within the, the, uh, the infrastructure of halakha, of Orthodox Judaism, trying to f find a space within it for all different kinds of voices to emerge. Wonderful. By the way, I just, I just want to say that, um, I mean, I have had some experience of seeing um, Rabbi Sarah Horowitz, just the way that she relates within the Orthodox community. And I think that, you know, those of us who are really uh, quite comfortable with the concept of female rabbis, and the conservative movement has had it for decades now, and some are more comfortable than others, but I think sometimes, you know, we, we just take certain things for granted, and there's a real kind of path-breaking um, thing that's going on here. Um, and, and, and very courageous. Um, I mean, you heard, you know, that um, you know, Rabbi Har was saying that she wanted to get to shul, right? Metaphorically and physically and dealing with whatever barriers happen to be there. But it's, it's not a slam dunk, I man. These are conversations that are still relatively very new and boundaries that are, that are really being explored. So it's, I mean, kol kabod, it's really, really remarkable. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just reflect a little bit on, on my sense of the American Jewish community. And to start by saying that, you know, each, in each generation, I think, uh, the freedoms grow and the boundaries in many respects diminish. So that when I was speaking uh, with a group in our congregation about their children and who their children were dating, 
Um, I asked the group who were people in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, you know, what percentage of your friends growing up was Jewish? And it was a pretty high percentage. And people, even in universities, were associating largely with Jews. When I asked them um, to think about their children and what their social dynamic looks like, in many instances, it's very, very different. Um, it's more open, it's more multicultural, and so we're dealing with um, an openness and a degree of autonomy that I think is pretty unprecedented. And it's going to um, continue to pose challenge and opportunity, you know, both. So we have had in the United States, um, certainly, um, people who have generation after generation come with a strong religious ethnic matrix. Certainly Jews from Eastern Europe came with an, a, a matrix of religion and ethics all combined, which included Yiddish and certain foods and certain cultural norms and certain patterns of observance. And we have in our congregation groups from the Middle East, from Iraq and Iran, also with a matrix of cultural and religious and ethnic